But today Audubon's life and work do present a fascinating paradox. In an effort to record, he could not help but destroy that which he wanted to understand. Wildness and nature cannot be possessed. It was this kind of personal relationship with the natural world that made him such a magnificent recorder of its beauty, violence, unpredictability, and realities. Welcome to Polk's America. I'm Thomas Samuel. In February of 2020, the small staff of the President James K. Polk Home and Museum set to work installing an exhibit entitled Audubon, Nature, and Nation. We moved the temporary walls into place and painted them sky blue. We built a case to hold a long rifle and recorded bird calls in the little speakers. We hung 12 original prints from the very first printing of John James Audubon's Birds of America. We were excited to share our work with guests and field trippers during our busy spring season. And then, like most museums across the country, we were forced to close due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Only a small fraction of guests actually got to see the exhibit before it closed. In some ways, this episode is bittersweet, a reminder of the conversations and history we were not able to share. Our guest is Katie McKinney. Katie is the Margaret Beck Pritchard Assistant Curator of Maps and Prints at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Her presentation, I Cannot Help Copying Nature, John James Audubon's Quadrupeds of North America, introduced us to the story of Audubon's final epic collection of prints and serves as a send-off to Audubon, Nature, and Nation. Here's Katie. If you're unfamiliar, Birds of America are 435 life-sized, hand-colored, double elephant folio engravings of American bird specimens that were published between 1827 and 1838. The scale of the book was truly amazing. Nothing like it had ever been accomplished. The double elephant folio is 50 inches tall, to give you an idea. The birds in the book were either derived from specimens that Audubon had killed, which I think surprises a lot of people that he actually had to kill these birds, um, but he also used specimens that he found in other collections. In addition to hunting birds, Audubon spent a great deal of time observing the behaviors, environments, and characteristics of these creatures from life. But each of the poses, interactions, the plants, and bugs, they're all there to tell you something about the behavior, anatomy, and habitats of these birds. I caught up with the Polk Homan Museum's curator, Candice Candido, on the opening night of the exhibit. Right now we have a show called Audubon, Nature and Nation, which delves into the phenomenon known as John James Audubon, who is of course um, a famous 19th century uh, naturalist, artist, um, and all around popular character, still beloved today. Um, we have 12 original first edition prints from Audubon's most famous work, Birds of America, which was published during James K. Polk's lifetime, sort of early on in, in Polk's political career. At the center of the show is this long rifle um, in a case right in the middle of the room, and that was done very intentionally to sort of introduce uh, several different important ideas at once. Most people have been surprised to learn that Audubon was actually hunting birds. So we think of him as a, as a naturalist and even a conservationist, and in, in a way he was, but the idea of what those um, roles mean has certainly evolved over the last 200 years. And in his day and age, Audubon would actually go out into the woods to find these species of birds and was shooting really incredible numbers of birds um, during his process of documenting and painting these creatures. The rifle was really sort of the central tool for Audubon and his work. And we see that really interestingly in the way that he is portrayed in portraiture from the period. So you would typically think of an artist being portrayed with the tools of his trade, maybe having a paintbrush in his hand, but instead John James Audubon is often depicted with a rifle. Um, the rifle was not only a practical central tool of Audubon's work, but it was also an important part of his self-image and the way that he wanted to be seen as he moved about the world. And the idea there was that he wanted to be seen 
as this new type of naturalist. He wanted to be seen as a man of the woods. So whereas um, in England, the study of nature and um, the artistic pursuit of documenting nature was something pursued by gentlemen, um, Audubon intentionally kept his hair long, he wore buckskin, um, he was depicted with a rifle, um, he was very much wanting to portray himself as this American woodsman. Um, and that was his primary identity that he really carefully crafted, both with um, the way he dressed, the way that he presented himself, and also the way that he wrote about himself and about his experiences um, interacting with these birds and, and creating um, this monumental work, Birds of America. Both Katie and Candace presented Audubon as an artist and naturalist who purposefully presented himself as an American outdoorsman. His personal image was an important selling point. Audubon's buckskin clothing and long rifle were part of a carefully crafted identity. He was born in Saint-Domingue, present-day Haiti, in 1785, the illegitimate son of a white French sea captain and plantation owner named Jean Audubon and a woman named Jean Rabin, who died shortly after his birth. Some scholars believe she was a recently arrived white French chambermaid. Others suspect that she might have been of African descent. The possibility that John James Audubon might be mixed race has been the subject of great debate. Despite the fact that his father was married back in France, he fathered three other children with a mixed race woman named Sanit Buffard, with whom he lived openly. With growing fears of slave insurrection in Saint-Domingue, his father sent his three-year-old son back to France to live with his legal wife. In 1803, Audubon arrived in the United States to avoid conscription in Napoleon's army. Audubon would later write cryptically about his origins, which might speak to his own insecurities about his racial background. He was now able to shape his own narrative, one of a white American frontiersman. By the 1820s, John Audubon had carved out a living as an artist painting portraits and other smaller works. But he dreamed of documenting all the birds of America. Leaving his wife and children at home in Kentucky, he journeyed across the nation in search of his avian subjects. In 1826, at the age of 41, John Audubon traveled to England with a folio containing hundreds of drawings. Here, the artist capitalized on his frontiersman image and sold subscriptions to the Birds of America. The printing process was expensive and labor-intensive, requiring hand engraving and coloring. But the results spoke for themselves. Beautiful, life-size images of American birds brought to life in unique style. The collection would go on to be considered one of the greatest works in American art history. Audubon's eventual success was due in part to greater cultural trends at work. Here's Candace Candido. There was a growing interest among Americans in this time period in learning about the natural world around them, in exploring and documenting, um, especially some of these newer lands that had come into the United States, um, as first as part of the Louisiana Purchase, and then later as the nation continues to expand. We've got a lot of overlap here between these ideas of um, Audubon wanting to go into the woods to document birds, to explore nature, um, and then also th this new generation of Americans wanting to use the natural world to solidify um, a distinct American identity for themselves. Purchasing um, a book like this for Americans who had the, the means to do so um, was a way to celebrate both an interest in nature and an interest in their nation and in this new American identity. There were um, new species of plants and trees and birds and mammals um, that existed here in North America that were unknown to Europeans and that were unfamiliar to that continent. So in that way, Americans were able to sort of claim these new species, these new lands as something that was unique to them, as something that, that set them apart from Europe um, and became a part of how they were able to craft, consume, and express a distinct American identity. Audubon rose to fame at a time when the United States was searching for an identity as a nation. The country was expanding westward. The Louisiana Purchase, followed by the addition of the Western Territories during the 1840s, provided new frontiers that inspired a sense of ownership and adventure. Audubon and his work embodied that feeling. After the success of Birds of America, Audubon set his sights on another ambitious project, documenting North American mammals. 
The catalyst that truly set the project in motion was a fateful meeting in Charleston in mid-October 1831, when Audubon and his team were collecting specimens for Birds of America. He was walking down the street in Charleston when a man jumped off his horse upon hearing the name Audubon and rushed over to meet the naturalist. This man was Reverend John Backman, a Lutheran minister and naturalist who had published on North American mammals. Like Audubon, Backman shared a love of nature from a young age. Later in life, he recounted how, as a child growing up in New York, an enslaved man named George first introduced him to his love of the natural world. George imparted his vast knowledge of hunting, trapping, and the habits and behaviors of wildlife onto the young man. He also helped the child trap and sell the fur of wild animals to raise money for his young master's scientific texts. This was obviously an unequal relationship. While Backman was permitted to study, read, and later become influential in the field of natural history, these were opportunities that would have almost been impossible for George. The story of George and John Backman was not unique. Generations of talent, ingenuity, and intelligence were suppressed by the system of slavery. Backman's love of nature, instilled in him through his interactions with George, could be channeled into a career and livelihood, while the talents and passions of enslaved men and women across the nation could not be. Katie shared how John Backman and John Audubon grew closer. Their families became entwined through the marriages of their children. And in the end, it would take collaboration between both the Backman and Audubon families to complete Audubon's final project, the viviparous quadrupeds of North America. Viviparous, meaning giving birth to live young, and quadruped, meaning four-legged. In 1841, now having successfully published all Birds of America, he purchased an estate called Minnie's Land on the banks of the Hudson River in New York, where he would embark on his final project. At Mitty's Land, he completed some of his earliest drawings for quadrupeds, including a family of skunks, which resided on the property. Like Birds of America, each plate is designed to show the anatomy, context, and behavior of the subject grouped in gendered pairs and sometimes by age. Through his work with birds, Audubon worked out a method by which he would draw the specimen to scale using a grid system, and then he would take notes and give instructions to whoever was painting the background regarding placement. By looking at the skunks, you can see his process. He first drew the young male and female in June 1842, and then the protective mother the following January. He cut out the babies and pasted them onto the paper with the mother. He instructed one of his sons who painted the backgrounds to duplicate this orientation, quote, to be placed on the rock, the young beneath it, so as to render them almost imperceptible in the shadows. Audubon's art combined taxidermy, watercolor, and collage to create lifelike and formative works that demonstrated the color and characteristics of his subjects. Once finished, each work would be sent to a printer who would duplicate the image through engraving. Each print would then be hand-colored by a team in an almost assembly line fashion, making each print unique in its own right. In the late 1820s, Birds of America had to be printed in England at the firm of Robert Havel due to the ambitious nature of the life-size project. Printing in America had greatly advanced since the 1820s. With the invention of lithography, the process was faster and cheaper. For their American printer, they selected John T. Bowen, who had published lithographs for the more affordable octavo edition of Birds of America. Logistically, the scale of quadrupeds would have to be smaller than that of birds. It would be impossible to try and print an engraving of a buffalo to scale. Audubon wanted the book to be large, though, and to make an impact, so we had decided that the plates would be 22 by 28 inches, what was called an imperial folio. The plan was to issue five new plates every two months with a projected 150 total. He felt that this project would only take two years. It took nearly a decade. Katie McKinney explained the process that Audubon and Backman would use during the Quadrupeds project. Audubon was responsible for creating the images while Backman would write the scientific descriptions. If Audubon was the beauty, Backman was the brains behind the operation. He dedicated his life to compiling lists of quadrupeds and studying American wildlife. He was nervous about the ambitious nature of the book for many reasons, including the lack of information on American mammals and Audubon's health. At the time of publication, regardless of illustrated text on quadrupeds, the information about them was scattered, inconsistent, and disorganized. Many specimens or texts were only found in private collections in America and Europe. At the time, nearly 190 new American species had been discovered, many of which received scientific names from Backman. Both Audubon and Backman knew that in order to create a more accurate and complete work, Audubon would have to travel west. Now in his 50s, having spent most of his life walking across America's woodlands and swamps, Audubon was able to admit that this would be his last big trip as a naturalist. The project allowed Audubon to travel to the Upper Missouri River, where they could snag large game specimens like elk, buffalo, and bear. 
It felt like the ultimate journey for the aging naturalist who had watched with envy as other adventurers had made the trip. If there is this idea that there might be more species to find, maybe large species, they might be found out west. Backman was skeptical about the route that Audubon planned on taking. He thought it was too well trodden by European and American settlers, and recently published upon more generally. In 1839, he wrote to Audubon that he might find it easier to accurately paint a buffalo in England than in the United States. Nonetheless, he supplied a list of specimens that he wanted them to collect and the types of behaviors he wanted them to record. Audubon put together a team that could help him hunt and collect specimens, including John G. Bell, a taxidermist who would later train Teddy Roosevelt. They set off from New York on March 11, 1843, and arrived in St. Louis on March 28th. From there, they traveled by steamboat up the Missouri River towards Fort Union. From their steamboat, the Omega, they observed animals and birds as they passed. Sometimes the ship would take breaks, giving the team the opportunity to hunt and collect specimens. After traveling on the Omega for 49 days, which was a record for the time, the team arrived at Fort Union at the confluence of the Missouri and Yellowstone Rivers around what is now the border between Montana and North Dakota on June 12th. They stayed at the fur trading post for two months. It was here that they did see some larger animals, like wolves, which were massacred with relish at dawn and dusk when the creatures came to the gates of the fort looking through garbage for food. Wolves were pests that were to be hunted. The team also set off on almost daily buffalo hunts, recording but mostly enjoying the thrill of the chase and the slaughter. They departed Fort Union on August 12th, having spent an enjoyable two months of hunting, and arrived in St. Louis on October 19th. Audubon finally returned to Minnie's Land on November 6, 1843. Audubon's final big adventure took him northwest to the Fort Union trading post near what is today the North Dakota and Montana border. Fort Union was established to facilitate trade with Native American tribes such as the Assiniboine, the Crow, Cree, Ojibwe, and others. Throughout his travels, John Audubon encountered Native Americans and recorded his meetings in his journals. So on his travels and on his um expeditions into the woods, Audubon records several encounters with Native people, and he really embodies and communicates um, really clearly this American notion of the noble savage that is um, really prevalent at this point in the 19th century. So Audubon describes um, observing um, and at times interacting with these indigenous people um, and he expresses the sense of sadness, which is really interesting, that he is, um, he, he really admires and writes about his, his respect for these um, people and the way that they're so in tune with nature, the skills that they have with hunting and fishing and um, even agriculture to an extent. But he talks about them as, as a relic of the past, as something that is um, a culture that's not able to survive in the inevitable progress that's coming. Um, and he sort of laments several times um, the inevitable death of indigenous people and their culture. Um, he, he recorded at one point observing a Seminole man in Florida um, on one of his expeditions and he wrote, Alas, thou fallen one descendant of an ancient line of freeborn hunters, would that I could restore to thee thy birthright, thy natural independence, the generous feeling that were once fostered in thy brave bosom, but the irrevocable deed is done. Um, I think that really tells us what we need to know about how Audubon is viewing these people, and, and he's not unique in that. In a lot of ways, that was sort of the mainstream perspective as Americans were moving further and further west, displacing um, more and more people groups, um, that as much as they may respect and revere um, these cultures in a way that was very other, very different, very foreign, um, in some ways very dehumanizing, they also um, didn't see any way around their demise. And here we encounter one of the great tragedies of the idea of manifest destiny, that strange emotional American zeitgeist. Audubon eulogizes the native people he encounters as a relic of the past. He respects, he laments, but he otherizes and infantilizes and in turn justifies. The destructive nature of American progress is assumed and accepted. <laughs> 
Upon his return from the Upper Missouri, Audubon sheepishly reported to Backman, The variety of quadrupeds is small in the country we visited, and I fear that I have not more than three or four new ones. Backman responded to his letter by saying, I'm glad that the western prairies have used you so well that you've grown fat on bison's humps. You were, I fear, too stationary for many new quadrupeds. And Backman was right. Over the course of the journey, John Bell, the the taxidermist, prepared 85 mammal skins, resulting in 27 species total. Rather than the large new species they'd hoped to find out west, they only found two small new species, including the Missouri mouse. Audubon was understandably afraid to show Backman his journals because many of his entries were not of a scientific nature. He finally relented when Backman threatened to quit the project, and Backman was understandably disappointed. For his diary's lack of academic rigor, Audubon had written down and gathered exciting stories of buffalo hunts, drunken fur traders, accounts of American Indians like the Mandan tribe, and encounters with grizzly bears. While still on the trip, Audubon would send such stories to his son, Victor, in New York and tell him to slip them to the press to drum up publicity. Backman was also disappointed by the disorganization of specimens sent back from the trip. When Backman opened a box that was supposed to contain a prairie dog, he wrote to Audubon, I'm exceedingly troubled about the prairie dog. Sometimes I think that a parcel of legs and a head that came in the box may be that species. There is, however, as usual, nothing labeled. Despite the setbacks, the project rolled forward. The first plates were published by Bowen in 1842, and that plate was of the common American wildcat, and the first full volume of plates was completed in 1845. It became clear that the Western journey had not produced enough specimens to create a work that would be at all taken seriously, and Audubon's health was beginning to fail. He was prone to bouts of drinking, and his eyesight was failing. So Backman deployed Audubon's son, John Woodhouse Audubon, to travel to Texas just as the Mexican-American War was beginning to find desirable specimens like the armadillo. John also hired scouts and soldiers to bring in specimens for bounty, like the jaguar. John would also travel to England to feverishly collect as much information as he could. Had it not been for John's efforts, they would never have completed the second volume. In the end, 72 of the 150 paintings for the Imperial Folio were by John Woodhouse Audubon. The Quadrupeds project grew exhausting and frustrating for Backman. John Audubon's trip out west failed to produce the subjects needed. Audubon's son was left to gather and paint the remaining specimens. Mix-ups in the printing process led to mislabeled mammals, and for Backman, the work of John Bell, Audubon's taxidermist, was sometimes questionable. And then there was the matter of the long-haired squirrel of California. And I'll just explain uh, using their own words. Backman complained, and I quote, that the tremendous scrotum was not given to it by its creator, whose works are natural, but was stuffed out of character by Bell, the taxidermist. To this, Audubon replied, I cannot help copying nature. And speaking of squirrels, the book is full of squirrels. One of Audubon's English patrons complained about the abundance of squirrels in the book. Audubon's response was, in talking of squirrels, you say, like our subscribers in this country, that there are rather too many, and yet what can be done? This is the land of squirrels and woodpeckers, and you must not be surprised to see a dozen more species of the former. In 1848, Backman, who was struggling to produce the second volume of text, visited Audubon at Minnie's Land and was deeply disturbed by what he saw. His old friend was there in body, but as Backman recounted, his mind was in ruins. Audubon is thought to have developed Alzheimer's disease and did not live to see the letterpress of the project finished. He died of heart failure on January 27, 1851, just a few months shy of his 66th birthday. John Audubon did not live to see the completed viviparous quadrupeds of North America. There is a final image of the artist, a daguerreotype, in which he looks sunken, absent, a stark contrast from his earlier portraits in buckskin with his long rifle. In his absence, Backman continued to work alongside Audubon's sons. Backman helped Victor finish up the third volume of text, which was finally finished on March 26, 1852. Backman could not contain his excitement when the book was finally done. He wrote that, I threw up my hat to the ceiling, kicked books, papers, rabbits, and squirrel skins and bats about the room, and felt that the nightmare of some years was off my breast. In the end, 150 prints showing an array of American mammals were finally published. They featured mammals that were familiar to East Coast urban audiences, like the raccoon, 
some species, once common on the East Coast, like the black bear, had moved inward, and their counterparts miles away like the polar bear. It focused on tiny creatures, as well as the large. They were exciting to look at, but they were scientifically important. For example, the common wild cat bears its teeth, because at the time this was a key identifying characteristic of that species. They include reminders of the human presence on the landscape, such as cut down trees, cottages in the background with smoke coming from their chimneys, and fences. They made judgments about the quality of animal that they were depicting. In one of the plates, a fox is shown with its foot in a trap, and it was meant to be trapped and killed. It was a pest, so it wouldn't disturb the livelihood of the farmer who owned the farm that was depicted in the distance. Overall, the plates were really a triumphant feat for the time. The book was the largest hand-colored book published in America to date. One critic proclaimed, at last, a great national work. Quadrupeds was published shortly after the James Polk presidency. The U.S.-Mexican War had stripped Mexico of California and much of the Southwest. The Oregon Territory and parts of the Northwest were gained through negotiations with England. The nation had transformed into a continental power. So what does Audubon and Backman and their monumental work tell us about Polk's America? How does this art and research speak to the nation and its development? Here's Katie. Polk was a major proponent of the concept of manifest destiny, a belief that justified westward expansion as a God-given right and the destiny of white Americans. While this was an exciting time for white Americans, it was an anxious, violent, and often deadly one for American Indians who were pushed from their lands. And it was an uncertain moment and disastrous moment for enslaved Africans. The question of whether or not slavery would expand west was a question it would take a civil war to answer. Audubon was part of this generation of Americans, like Polk, who looked westward, but who were largely unaware of what their impact would be on the people, animals, and landscapes that were already there. Within another generation or two, that impact was harder to ignore. In 1840, a few years before Audubon's trip to the upper Missouri to hunt, there were roughly 35 million buffalo. By about 1890, that number was down to 541. Many factors contributed to this astonishing slaughter, largely as a result of westward expansion. They were hunted for profit and sport. The U.S. military slaughtered buffalo as a tactic to destroy the food source of Native American tribes and to push them off their lands. One of the species that Audubon discovered, the black-footed ferret, is today on the endangered species due to loss of habitat, food sources, and disease. This was something no one in Audubon's time would have been able to comprehend. Still, Audubon's plates are significant in many ways, particularly because they capture a snapshot of American history and ecology in a pre-photographic age, and it's perhaps the first time most Americans saw some of these animals in full color. In Audubon's time, and really before the knowledge of DNA in the 1980s, the understanding of mammal species was based on their physical characteristics, and that included the pelage or fur color. So these illustrations were a scientifically important contribution to mammalogy because they showed in full color what pages of text simply couldn't do alone. It's difficult to reconcile and place Audubon's own concept of conservation ethics within our own time. But today, Audubon's life and work do present a fascinating paradox. In an effort to record, he could not help but destroy that which he wanted to understand. As Audubon understood in his youth, wildness and nature cannot be possessed. It was this kind of personal relationship with the natural world that made him such a magnificent recorder of its beauty, violence, unpredictability, and realities. In his lifelong journey to draw what he saw in nature, he left behind a remarkable record of American mammals and birds, but also magnificent works of art. This has been Polk's America, a podcast produced by the President James K. Polk Home and Museum in Columbia, Tennessee. I'm your host, Thomas Samuel. Our guests were Katie McKinney and Candace Candido. The lovely fiddle music was performed by Debbie Lewis. For more information, visit jameskpolk.com or find us on social media. Thanks for listening.